This tour was originally created by Harbor Friends, a nonprofit, and funded by the Coastal Zone Management Act by NOAA's Office of Ocean and Coastal Resource Management in conjunction with Minnesota's Lake Superior Coastal Program. Both the Coastal Program and Harbor Friends have given the Cook County Historical Society permission to use and modify the tour materials so that this tour is possible. We'll start here on the lawn in front of the Cook County Historical Society Museum, which is actually the original house of the first lighthouse keeper. It was built in 1896 and occupied by Joseph Mayhew and his family. There's much more information in the museum about the lighthouse keepers, their families, and how long they stayed and used that house. So we'll not cover that here, but we're going to walk now to Boulder Park and start our tour. We've walked through the small parking area and through the large boulders and we are by a picnic table in Boulder Park. I want to stop here first because the name of this town, Grand Marais, is related to the history of the harbor. We'll talk first about the name Grand Marais. If you have been exposed to elementary French during your schooling, you'll know that Grand Marais is Great Marsh. It's the common French translation. but if you look around, you don't see any marshland. Could it have been all filled in? Well, some people have said so, but that doesn't make any sense. When the U.S. Corps of Engineers became involved in the Grand Marais Harbor, the first thing they did was survey and map the harbor itself and the surrounding land. Almost yearly, the Corps produced a map to accompany their yearly reports. This 1903 map shows when marshlands did once exist, a small area with a pond of only about 3.4 acres. And that's it for marshlands, because the early inhabitants had neither equipment or purpose to fill wetlands. Wetlands were of value to the original inhabitants for what they could yield. The area was ultimately filled in and new floods regularly with heavy rain. A reminder of its history as a wetland, the parking lot in front of the Whole Foods Co-op and Stone Harbor and the city buildings across the street are also subject to flooding. But 3.4 acres simply does not constitute a great marsh. This second map dates back to the 1820s and was created by a very famous cartographer, Lieutenant Henry Bayfield. Bayfield was a, a member of the Royal Navy and he mapped the Great Lakes and his maps are famous for their accuracy. If you were a captain taking a ship onto Lake Superior, you might demand as part of your employment maps for your journey that he had created. You can see on the map the Grand Marais Harbor and prominently you can also see in very large printed note that reads, Good Boat Harbor Improperly Named the Grand Marais. So Lieutenant Henry Bayfield of the Royal Navy would have been speaking classical French. So when he looked at that interpretation and he went and he surveyed the harbor, he didn't see a great marsh. He said it was improperly named. So I think that's pretty interesting information. And you kind of have to remember, you know, these maps weren't just sort of printed on a piece of paper. They were from etchings in copper. So this comment was serious. It wasn't the scribble of a magic marker. If not the French interpretation of Marais, M-A-R-A-I-S, what is the meaning? Voyagers plied these waters for many years before settlement began. They were French, but had their own peculiar language usage. To the voyager, Marais meant quiet waters or protected bay, a meaning that was important to their business of paddling these great waters. There are, in fact, other Marais, M-A-R-A-I-S, around the lake. There's Grand Marais, Michigan. Um, Little Marais, there's a number of them and they simply are not associated with vast wetlands of any kind. They are protected bays, however, and good places for these voyagers to land. Also, you can note on the Bayfield map that there's an island and there's never been an island in this harbor. Uh, Lieutenant Bayfield knew there was no island, but it was like a copyright. If someone produced a map of Grand Marais with an island in it, it was a forgery. So it was his way of protecting his work. Before we move toward the harbor, getting closer to the harbor, I also want to talk about ownership of the land. 
Early inhabitants were all Native Americans. Tribes of Dakotas, or Sioux, occupied the area until around 1500 when the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, or Chippewa, we call them, took possession. In the 1850s in Minnesota, many tribes were signing treaties. In 1854, this area came under the Treaty of La Pointe and was officially open to settlement. The land was transferred from the Anishinaabe and then auctioned off by the government to private individuals. Ownership of land around the harbor went through many people until by 1900 it was owned by only three men. Samuel Howenstein owned the entire west shoreline. Ted Wakeland owned the north shore and Henry Mayhew owned this side, the east side, including the point. Again over time ownership passed to others until this east side was owned by Consolidated Paper out of Wisconsin. The point was and is owned by the federal government and the Coast Guard owns the land only to their fence line which is uh, the north edge of their property. The paper companies act logs in this area. Early on logs were floated in rafts to Wisconsin and also shipped by specially designed boats and when roads were good enough the logs left by truck. In the early 1980s, Consolidated Papers stopped the business of shipping logs and gave their property to the city of Grand Marais. Two-thirds of the property was given under lease to the DNR for the parking lot and the boat landing. This boulder park where we've been standing was the northern one-third, and this is what it is now. It became Boulder Park. We'll walk closer to the harbor shoreline so we can look at the north side of the harbor from here you can see Harbor Park with Bear Tree Park adjacent and to the west. The site of Harbor Park was for many, many years a gas station. You can see the round concrete pads at the beach. These were supports for a fuel dock built by Standard Oil in 1927 so boats could offload fuel for the station. The park was established and the station torn down. The last owner of the station, Jean Erickson, was generous and allowed the community to seek grants and gather donations to buy and build the park. You'll notice that throughout the park are inconspicuous capped well pipes, allowing for monitoring of the subsurface pollution that the long use of the property as a fuel depot and station left behind. So Harbor Park was born from the cooperation between private and public funding sources, lots of donations and lots of volunteer hours, and was completed in 2007. To the west of Harbor Park, you can see what looks like a pole with a lump toward the top. This small park is called Bear Tree Park, and the pole with a lump, when seen up close, is a sculpture of bear cubs up a tree. It was an art colony project. They brought well-known sculptor Raymond Gromley to Grand Marais, who then created the Bear Tree in 1954. Further to the west, you can see an inner marina breakwater. This breakwater was built by the Corps of Engineers in 1959 in response to the increasingly frequent storm damage incidents that occurred once the harbor's increased depth due to dredging allowed for more powerful waves to pound on the unprotected fish houses. I would suggest that you visit the museum's recreation of a fish house at the west end of the marina. There are lots of photos and descriptions, including the narrations about the devastating storm damage that the fish houses were exposed to. We'll walk along the harbor shore further south so we can look back at the town and the northeast corner of the harbor where the trading post now stands. That corner is now water. It was at one time land, as you can see in this remarkable 1910 photo of a baseball game being played on that land. This land and much more material beneath the harbor was removed through dredging. To understand why so much dredging happened is part of the turn of the century, the early 1900s. The thought process is going on. Mining on the Iron Range brought great wealth to Duluth as railroads hauled the rich ore to the port for shipping. It was an era when Duluth had more millionaires per capita than any other city in the region. Planners in Grand Marais had similar dreams, as you can see in the early drawing of the harbor, complete with railroad and huge ore docks. Everybody was going to be rich, and mining of the ore in the Gunflint Lake area would fuel the boom. 
but the existing harbor was shallow. The Corps of Engineers took all of this to heart and planned the massive dredging to accommodate the larger ships they anticipated and the mood of the time. The original Corps directed dredging was around the Mayhew dock to accommodate the large steamships and sailing boats, which were responsible for carrying goods in and out of Grand Marais, as there were no roads and ships were efficient. This dredging began in 1880 and continued for 68 years. The depth of the harbor was significantly deepened, as you can see on the profile drawing. The Corps contracted out most of the work. To add incentive was the fact that gravel could be barged to Duluth and Superior and sold for their infrastructure work. We'll always wonder if the scant occurrence of Native American and Voyager artifacts in this harbor is due to the fact that they may now be part of some road in Duluth. In 1923, Whitney Brothers, out of Superior, obtained permits to dredge and did so for seven years before the Corps finally put an end to the dredging because it was damaging the harbor. It was in that time that the land in the northeast corner of the harbor was removed. Over the 68 years of Corps-directed dredging, 483,416 cubic yards were removed from the harbor. In the seven years of Whitney Brothers dredging, 1923 to 1930, 420,795 cubic yards were removed. This massive removal of material doubled the overall depth. The harbor actually became less safe for small craft because the depth allowed for more powerful waves. So the harbor we are looking at is deeper and six acres larger than it was. The mining failed and the railroad never came. We are now standing close to the public launch area. The U.S. Coast Guard building and other associated structures are pretty much the same as they were when they were built in 1928 by local contractor Ed Nunstead. Visibility from the Coast Guard building to the southeast was obstructed by the high knob of the wooded point. Radio communications were not considered reliable at that time, so a tower was put up on the knob to enable visual contact with ships. The tower was manned 24 hours a day during the shipping season. The remains of the places where the tower's legs were attached to the bedrock are still visible on the wooded point. South of the Coast Guard building, where the yacht club docks are now floating, was the site of the Mayhew dock. The site of the Mayhew store, house, post office, trading post. It was all located north of the Coast Guard building. We'll walk around the Coast Guard building, but before that I wanted to make a small detour to look at something in the East Bay. When the water is low, these structures are more visible, but each year the lake claims more of them. You can see what looks like dock remains, but not possible. Docks here would be subjected to some rather dangerous wave action. These structures are called groins, G-R-O-I-N-S. They are engineered to break up waves and therefore reduce shoreline damage. They were put in to protect the Coast Guard station. Now you can see the rock they've hauled in for that purpose. We're walking up steps to put us on what seems like a pretty convenient sidewalk. It wasn't built for our convenience, however. This 419-foot seawall was constructed in 1937 to fill in the gaps in the natural rock. Before this seawall, it was necessary for the lighthouse keeper to use a boat to get to the lighthouse unless there was safe ice he could cross. There are really no dock remains near where the Yacht Club docks are attached now, but as we walk further I can point out some of the old timber that sticks out from the land. These docks were huge and even had warehouse buildings on them. As we walk on the seawall toward the lighthouse, we'll stop to look at carvings of names in the smooth, wave-washed rock between our walkway and the lake. This area is where seamen, ship passengers, or those waiting for them would spend time and obviously brought chisel and hammer on occasion. This rock is called breakwater basalt. It's hard, unyielding, but apparently seemed worth the effort to memorialize yourself in a display we see. Sometimes these are over a hundred years old. 
We'll stop on the rock just before the cabled area of the walkway. From here, you can see the old dock timber is still attached to the land. Also from here, we can see an iron structure called a bollard, which is what these huge steamships were tied to. The ships that came to the Grand Marais Harbor were of varying sizes and designs, but a few notable ones stand out because they carried passengers and mail. One of the first steamers serving the pioneers during the late 1800s through the turn of the century was the Dixon. The Dixon was destroyed by fire, and the America took over. The America was big, 280 feet long, and was owned by the Booth Fishing Company. It carried fish, freight, passengers, and the U.S. mail. The America sank off Isle Royal in 1928. Her wreck can be observed from the tour boat that travels to Isle Royal because water is so clear. The great six-foot wheel of the America is on display at the museum. Other ships, like the Winya, traveled in and out of the harbor into the 1930s. It wasn't until robes improved vastly and trucking became the predominant method of shipping that these boats actually stopped coming. This little harbor was a very, very busy place. Um, one season they recorded 350 steamships, just one season, and 79 barges and 57 motorboats. Most of the motorboats were probably from fishermen. Who knows what the barges were carrying, maybe a lot of gravel that had been dredged. As we walk beyond the cabled walkway and up the rock, you will also notice holes for utility poles. And at the top of the rock, you'll see the bases for the four tower legs of what was once a fire tower. The tower was 80 feet tall, and it may seem very odd to have a fire tower nearly surrounded by views of the water. It was erected in 1928 and remained until 1945, when it and the Coast Guard Tower on the wooded point were both removed. So why was it ever here? It was because the people of Grand Marais were more than a little afraid of fire, that they wouldn't see it pop up over the hill that the city sits against, and they would be surprised. The fear they felt certainly was related to the terrible fire of 1908. A drought in the summer of 1908 left forests throughout the region tinder dry. In early September, the fire started in numerous locations until fire extended from Grand Rapids, Minnesota to the north and west and to Thunder Bay. It spread north to Hibbing, Minnesota and on to the border lakes. In a massive wildfire, all of the North Shore was burning, as was the South Shore to Washburn, Wisconsin. The wireless in Grand Marais had to be shut down. The only communication was through ships carrying messages out of the fire area. One headline out of the area read, Grand Marais feared lost. At the height of the fire, the governor ordered a gunship, the Gopher, to leave from Duluth with firefighters and requested that the steamship America also head up the shore to help. It was terrifying for the settlers. The America stopped all along the shore, picking up fleeing people. The shore was said to be teeming with fleeing wildlife as well. Grand Marais had a firebreak around the village, but part of the Chippewa city burned. The smoke was very bad, and a number of infants perished because of the choking air. Rain came suddenly, and the fires ended. The 1908 fire was not the only fire that threatened Grand Marais over the years, so the fear was real. Ahead from this fire tower site, we look at the breakwater and the lighthouse. This east breakwater and the west one were designed more than a hundred years ago by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and are approximately 350 feet long. The east side breakwater was begun in 1881 and completed in 1883. Charles M. Wilson from Grand Portage was the contractor. The core is wood cribbing filled with rock. Diagrams of the cribbing show it has many of what can only be described as small crib units that are stacked and overlapped to form the core of the breakwater. Almost continuous repair over many years finally resulted in the concrete-clad structure we see today. Concrete was poured down through the original crib structure. There are museum photos showing the breakwater where all the wood was still there and before it was clad in concrete. The original wood lighthouse was built in 1885. 
an octagonal cast lantern was incorporated into a timber-framed enclosed pyramid timber tower approximately 32 feet tall. The structure was laid at the end of the East Breakwater and was damaged every couple years, sometimes severely, as the lake waves pounded on the wood structure. In 1923, the old timber structure was replaced with the steel structure we see today. The West Breakwater was built in 1902 and 1903. Cribbing was floated up from Duluth and dropped into place and filled with rock. The West Breakwater followed the East Breakwater's similar history of improvement. It was impacted by lake waves, repaired, damaged, and repaired. Huge rocks were barged and dumped on the entire lakeside of the West Breakwater to help break the force of the lake. Even as recently as May 2009, the Coast Guard barged up rock and with a giant crane placed rock on the inside face of the breakwater in continuing efforts to keep the old structure stable. The first light on the west breakwater was on an iron pole which was replaced almost immediately by a metal tower. Finally, the D9 cylinder in place today was installed in the 1960s. For this lighthouse on the east side, the light was provided by a Fresnel lens until automation provided the navigational beam. The lens was successfully moved in 2012 and is now the focus of a display inside the museum. The lens focused the light source into a concentrated beam and flashed the light by means of another finely crafted clock-like mechanism. It necessitated the time and skilled attention of a light keeper. And really, the lighthouse had these keepers until it was fully automated in 1937. A significant question to ask here is where did all the labor come? All this rock hauling and this building of these these various structures and primarily it was considered to be a job that the Anishinaabe did. The Anishinaabe had a settlement just east of town called Chippewa City and it actually grew during that time so it's likely that many of these men were getting their paycheck from building these breakwaters. So this is kind of where I end the tour, but please feel free to go on out and look closer at the lighthouse, or crawl over the carved rock, or go out to the wooded point and find the site of the Coast Guard Tower. It's all public and it's all part of our history. Thank you.